So welcome to our English worship this morning. Early last year, we began a sermon series on the twelve minor prophets of the Old Testament. The title of the series is Minority Report. And notice the singular and not plural. This is because the twelve minor prophets are not just twelve individualistic prophetic books. Biblical scholars believe that they were carefully put together after the Israelites returned from exile to form one unified volume. So it's twelve books, but also one book. Now the prophetic volume begins with Hosea and concludes with Malachi. It begins with "Go, take to yourself a wife of Hordom," and hundreds of years later, it closes with God saying again, "I have." Love you, and I am still loving you. So the book of the twelve, as a volume, is in other words God's prolonged love song for His rebellious people. And the, at the heart of that love song is a persistent call for repentance. God did not say to you to, to say to us that do whatever you want, I will love you no matter what. Do whatever you want.、Uh, you come home, and I will still take you back to my home. No, it is a persistent call for repentance, and that's God's love song. And that same love song continues to ring true today, urging you and me to repent from our heart, return to the Lord for life, true life, and eternal life. Before Easter, we have taken time to review Hosea, Joel, Amos. Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah—six prophets in all. So today we will begin the second half recap with Nahum and Habakkuk. So we、we'll、begin with Nahum. Notice that Nahum is not an island by himself, but is a member of the group of the twelve. He is therefore closely connected to the rest of the prophets, especially for those before him, and especially Jonah and Micah. So these three prophets are meant to be read together. Some scholars consider Nahum to be a sequel to Jonah. They have a common subject in the great city of Nineveh. So Jonah was about Nineveh, and Nahum was about. Nineveh. Together, they form a tale of two Ninevehs. Jonah's Nineveh repented and escaped disaster from the Lord. Nahum's Nineveh returned to her evil way and eventually received God's just punishment. Let me take you to Nahum. Nahum chapter one, verse one. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. Of Elkish, Nahum is actually a long poem. If you read it out loud, three chapters, what you got is about eight minutes. It is a long poem with an extraordinary opening about the nature of God. Nahum chapter one verse two: The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keep his wrath. For his enemies, how often you open a conversation with a non-believer with this? You know, if people ask you, your friend from school, from、uh, work, from church, even ask you, what kind of a God is your God? How often you begin with, he is a jealous, avenging God, wrathful, and he will take vengeance on all the sinners, all these people who are his enemies. Who are God's adversary? Who are God's enemies? In the book of Nahum, if we are reading just Nahum, God's enemies are Nineveh and the Assyrians. Now, some of you remember Nineveh from the book of Jonah. Again, I want you to take you back to the history of it. Remember, Jonah was sent as a prophet to proclaim. A message of judgment on Nineveh. Now that happened around the year 750 before Christ. So that long time ago, Jonah went to the city, going a day's journey, and called out, "Yet forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown." And that's his message. And guess what? Lo and behold, the people of Nineveh actually believe God. 
So in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, they said, The Nineveh believed God, and they called for a fat put on sackcloth, repenting. They, from the greatest of them to the least of them, and Nineveh turned around. And so what happened to God? God also turned around. Uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, When God saw that what they did, and that they turned from the evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. So they escaped. But sadly, Nineveh's repentance did not last long. So look at the next number. Five years later, 750 before Christ, they returned to their balance way. So after Jonah, the next prophet is Micah. And Micah basically continued along their history. In Micah, Nineveh and the people of Assyria continued to go south, down, down to invade Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And so the northern kingdom of Israel fell to Assyria, to Nineveh, in the year 722. And they continued their movement forward and downward into the southern kingdom of Judah. And finally, enough is enough. We have a prophet by the name of Nahum appearing around the year 660 to 630 BC, prophesying about the downfall of Nineveh. And his prophecy came through in the year 612 BC, when Nineveh and the Assyrian were conquered by the Babylon. So that's the history of Nineveh with the people of God. Now the evil and sins of Nineveh were obvious from Jonah all the way through Micah to Nahum. But while Jonah and Nahum prophesied against Nineveh's evil, some of you may remember for Micah, his prophecy were actually targeted not against Nineveh, but against Israel and Judah. And in the book of Micah, Nineveh and Assyria was used by God to execute his judgment on his own wayward, rebellious people, Israel and Judah. So if you read these three books together, if you read Jonah, Micah, and Nahum together like a group of three brothers, with that big brother in the middle, that big brother is actually Judah and Israel. God's people are the evil ones. So you have Nineveh on the side, but right in the middle, there is another bigger evil group of people, and that is Israel and Judah. So we ask, when you look at the overall message, what kind of a God is Yahweh? Yahweh is a jealous and avenging God, not only towards Nineveh. He is also a jealous and avenging God towards his own people, Israel and Judah. So the fall of Nineveh is supposed to be a mirror. It's supposed to be a prophecy, a warning from Judah. So if you are a rebellious people and you read about the downfall of a rebellious nation, what should be the message? The message is, oh great, another evil kingdom fell. No, the message is, if it happened to them, it will happen to me also, unless I repent. So as you read through these three books, you begin to see that the rob of God is actually moving to the center. The rob of God is against his own people because his own people are worshiping other gods. And unless they turn away from the worship of other gods and idols and return to the Lord, they too eventually will receive God's punishment. We can outline Nahum with the following three points. The three points are the fall of Nineveh, comfort for Judah. And number three, I am a jealous God. Now notice how we are actually reading Nahum backwards. I begin with chapter three, move to chapter two, and eventually to chapter one. It's a little bit like climbing a mountain. We begin with the foot of the mountain. What do we see at the foot of the mountain? The fall of Nineveh. We move to the middle of the mountain. What do we see? We see comfort. Good news, salvation for Judah. And what we move to the top of the mountain, what we see is the very nature of God. I am Yahweh, and Yahweh is a jealous God. So these are the three points. But if we expand our horizon a little bit to the gang of three brothers, remember? The three gang brothers are Jonah, Micah, and Nahum. 
and Jonah and Nahum are about Nineveh. But the middle, Micah, is actually about Israel, about Judah. Okay, so what we have is that we can transform these three points to become the fall of Judah. Comfort not for everyone in Judah, only for the returning remnant of Judah. So that becomes the theme of the minor prophet. Some of you know if you have been around for a while, you know that the minor prophet are not talking about good news for everyone, for God's people. But he's calling God's people to return, and some of them will return. Others will not, just like some of you here are returning. Other people are not. And it is declaring the fall, the destruction of those who refuse to return. And then good news and salvation for those who are returning. So that's what we got now. The fall of Judah, comfort for the remnants, for the returning, repenting remnants, because God is a jealous God. But if we further expand our horizon to include all the Gentiles, the Chinese, the American, and all that, the three point will become something like this. The four sinners and comfort for the repentant because God is a jealous God. And that's the gospel, right? That there will be a judgment for all sinners. But God is also gracious and merciful. Therefore, he called the sinners to return and repent. And if they will return and repent, there will be comfort, there will be a salvation for them. And at the top of the mountain, when we get to the mountain to worship, that God will realize that he is a jealous, jealous God. He, he, is, he is also the loving and merciful one because he provided salvation for those who are turning to him. The fall and the comfort. We all understand the part about the fall. We all understand the part about judgment because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of his glory. And the wages of sin is death. And after that, that comes judgment. It is just right that the sinful shall be punished. That's what justice demands. But what about comfort? How could these sinful people receive comfort? And from where can we derive this comfort from? I want to take you to Hosea. Hosea is where we find the comfort. Theologians tell us that at the center, the, the, the key, verse, key verses of the 12 prophets is, uh, you know, are embedded in Hosea, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Hosea chapter 3, verse 4, what it is, is the fall of God's, I have a little out there, rebellious sons. And then, Verse 5 is, there will be a comfort for God's, another owl, stand for returning sons. So there are two groups of people among God's people. One group continues to stay rebellious. The other group are returning and repenting. So there will be the fall, there will be a destruction, a judgment for those who are rebellious. But there will be a salvation for God's people who are returning. Now, do you see that 4 and 5 are actually mirror image and extrapolation basically of one and two. So I want you to take you to Hosea chapter three, chapter three, verse four and five. And that's what theologians believe to be at the very heart, the key to understand how God salvation come about to his people eventually. Hosea chapter three, verse four. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without kings, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household god. And then verse 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Verse 4. The children of God shall dwell many days without king. It's a picture of exile. There would be no more king. There would be no more kingdom. They, they used to have the northern kingdom of Israel. They used to have the southern kingdom of Judah. But no more. Why? Because of their sin, because of their rampant idolatry. God decided to destroy them. And then without, there, there will be many days without sacrifice, without pillar, without ephod, without household God. No sacrifice. Why? Because they have been taken to Babylon. No more household God, no more evil. God is sick and tired of their worshipping the idol of the land. So God took them away so that they could not worship those idols anymore. Well, that's God's punishment, the exile. 
But then, thankfully, these are not the last words of the prophet Hosea. Hosea continued with 3, 5. And afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. Afterward, they will come back. They will be able to worship Yahweh their God and David their king. It's a new David. It's David is not going to come back in resurrection, but there will be a son of David who will be the promised king. And they shall come in fear of the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. So afterwards, how long will that afterwards be? Now, some of you know Israel history. They were in exile for 40, uh, 70 years. So God was mad at them. God wiped out the northern kingdom. God wiped out the southern kingdom. And then for 70 years, they were away. And then after 70 years, afterward, they can come back to seek the Lord their God. So God, God's anger, God's wrath subsided after that. So the repentant and returning remnant of God could return to him in worship. Now, if this is a story, do you feel like something is missing? There, there is a void somewhere. So God was angry with them for 70 years or longer. And then God decided that he will be angry no more. God forgive them. And so they come back. Does this sound like a Bible story? It doesn't. Something is missing. Does God's wrath just go away after 70 years? And some of you may say, of course, why should, why, why should he keep on getting angry? Come on, God, get a life. You have been mad at your people for 70 years. That's enough. And so God, after 70 years being angry with his people, he stopped being angry. God, you did good. Forgive and forget. Move on. Is that how the story goes? No, the answer is no. The truth is that God's anger is still there, ever burning so brightly. Something is missing. When man called God, God, get a life, forgive us. God called man and said, come on, man, do you know me? I'm a holy God, I'm a jealous God, avenging God, taking vengeance on my adversary. Seventy years are not enough. Eternity is not enough. Have you not heard from me, said the Holy God, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. God cannot just let go and forget. That is not the God, the nature of our God. He looked at sin seriously. He takes sin seriously. You cannot just forgive you after 70 years. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And I'm not talking about just blood. I'm not talking about animals' blood. I'm not talking about evil people's blood. I'm not talking about our blood. Our blood cannot quench the wrath of God. What is needed is perfect blood, precious blood. That's the only thing that, that quenched that wrath of God, so that the children of God can return, you see. There's something that is missing in this verse. There's something Hosea didn't quite tell us until a bloody sacrifice was made, until a perfect sacrifice was made, until the justice of God is satisfied. The wrath of God could not be removed. And now you begin to understand where all these things are pointing to us. There need to come a king who will die on behalf of his people. And that king has to be perfect. Has to be perfect. And that's how afterwards can come about. Without that, there will be no afterwards. Without that, there will be no verse 5. There will be verse 4. We'll be stuck in verse 4, replaying verse 4 forever and ever and ever. And then came Jesus. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. See, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus came not as a poor man from Galilee. Jesus came as God's king. 
And the king has come to the holy city to do what? To bring about judgment. So Jesus said, look, your house is left to you desolate. God is going to punish you. God is going to wipe you out. But yet, in the middle of this prophecy, the declaration of God's judgment, Jesus seems to be prophesying about his own death also. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you are a city that will kill prophets and stone those who are sent to you, and I'm one of them. He's ready to die. And then in his death, he said, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hand gathered her brood under her wings, but you were just not willing. So the king has come. The king has come to bring about judgment. But while judgment was pouring down, if you can imagine a movie, that Jesus is calling on fire from heaven to come down. This is, you know, Gomorrah, Sodom, Gomorrah, all over again. And he is coming down, the fire is coming down, but the king who declared this fire will not leave the city. Somehow he decided to stay with the people who deserve to die. And then in the middle of the city, he opened up his wing and he said, whoever will come, here's my shelter for you. I will perish for you. How often would I have gathered your children together like and gather her brood under her wing? He opened his wing on the cross. That's our Lord Jesus. He turned our fall into comfort, you see. How can there be comfort and uh, how can there be a destruction, a declaration of judgment and comfort at the same time? That's because the only one who could save us, he stayed in the city with us at destruction. So at the cross, he opened up his wing, gathered all who would come, everyone who know that we are sinners and who will repent and return to the Lord. And that's what Nahum eventually points us to. So let me sum up for you the book of Nahum in one minute. Let's give it a try. Nahum's poem continues stories of Nineveh from Jonah and Micah, declaring judgment and bringing comfort to God's people. The Lord is a jealous God, taking vengeance on his enemies. Who are God's enemies? Valence, Nineveh, all these evil country people of this world, sure, but also the rebellious children of God. So Israel fell and Judah will perish, but the repenting remnant will be comforted. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, David the king, and they shall come in fear of the Lord and to his goodness. So Jesus came to Jerusalem, declaring judgment, yet bringing comfort for the repentant sinners from the cross. The Lord is good, a stronghold on the day of trouble. And the trouble is not your final exam. The trouble is not your new job. He knows those who take refuge in him. The trouble is final judgment. And he knows and he loves those who take refuge in him. No one can serve two master because our Lord is a jealous God. So let us forsake all our idols, because God hates idols. He sent them to exile because of the idols. Let us take up our cross and follow Jesus. So let me summarize for you and apply Nahum with three points. Nahum, you turn is the way. Nahum brings comfort, salvation, and judgment. Judgment for the rebels, salvation for the remnant. And good news from the cross, we turn and we serve a jealous God, and we serve him only. After Nahum, let's turn to Habakkuk, the eight prophets on the list of the twelve. Now, very interestingly, Habakkuk actually form a close pair with Nahum. They are, again, linked together. What is Nahum about, remember? Nahum is about the fall of Nineveh and Assyria. What is Habakkuk about? Habakkuk is about the fall of Babylon. So kingdom A and kingdom B. Kingdom A is Assyria. Kingdom B is Babylon. Nahum prophesied about the fall of Assyria. And now Habakkuk is going to prophesy about the fall of Babylon. So these two little books, if you read from your Bible, they're only three chapters each. 
they form a very powerful pair that will topple two great empires from the ancient world, Assyria and Babylon, Nahum chapter 2 and Habakkuk chapter 2. Nahum chapter 2 verse 13, Behold, I'm against you. I'm against Assyria. So Assyria will fall. God is the God who controls the nation. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, Behold, his soul is puffed up. That's talking about Babylon. Your soul is puffed up and thought, you know what? I'm going to destroy you. So God will bring destruction to do two great empire of the ancient world. But notice there is one positive note and application for all of us, for the people of God. He said, look at the people that I will judge. Look at all the evil, unrepentant people that I will judge. But the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Now, the righteous here doesn't mean someone who is perfect or sinless. You know, you know that. I've been repeating this very often. The righteous refer to those people who serve the Lord, who, who worship the one true God. Unlike the unrighteous, the unrighteous will worship something too, but they will worship the idol, the false God. But the righteous are the one who is faithful to Yahweh. Not perfect, but faithful. Not, not blameless, absolutely perfect, but they are the one who will serve only Yahweh. And Habakkuk said, the righteous one, those who are covenant keeper of Yahweh, shall live by faith. They will receive true life by faith. What does that really mean? I don't you remember that actually there are three translations, possible translation of this verse. And three translations are, but the righteous shall live by his faithfulness, his being faithful to the Lord. The second translation is, but the righteous shall live by his faith, by his trusting in God. And number three is, the righteous shall live by my faithfulness. So it's not the man or the woman's faithfulness, but God's faithfulness. And some of you remember what I said, that one is actually probably the best translation here. And Habakkuk is saying that the righteous who is faithful to Yahweh will be saved by their faithfulness. But two and three are not wrong. They represent some theological framework and inner logic behind the scenes. So let me try to explain to you uh, this way, you know, by the way of A, B, and C. So the story goes something like this. We go from A to B and to C. Everything begins with the faithfulness of God. Where does salvation come from? Where does true life come from? It comes from the faithfulness of God. It comes from Yahweh's promise to save. If God did not come up with a salvation plan, none of us can devise our own salvation plan. We don't have that resources. But God has. So God promised to save, and His faithfulness means that He will fulfill that promise. No salvation will be available to us if God is not faithful, if God does not promise. And the faithfulness of God call for B, call for us to believe in Him, to trust in Him, for, for our faith, our reliance upon His salvation. We are saved not by our being good. We are saved not by our faithfulness. We are saved by our leaning upon, by our trusting in God's faithfulness. However, C, if you have true faith, if you truly rely on God, if you truly trust God, that trust will necessarily and inevitably lead to a life of faithfulness, faithful covenant keeping, covenant serving the Lord. Or maybe I can try to explain this by way of an analogy of a plant, a planting and growing a tree. So A is God's faithfulness. A is the source of life and the soil of redemption. So a tree cannot grow without soil. Who provides a soil? Not you, not the tree, but God. So God's faithfulness provides a source of life, a soil of redemption. Then B is the faith of the righteous. It's like the roots that run deep. So a tree cannot grow unless it has roots that run deep into the soil so that absorbing the, nut the nutrition that's with us, sinful life now begins to have life. It now has, is connected to the source of life and the soil of redemption. And then it grows into a tree. 
The tree is what we see outside, but there is a tree because there is root. The roots go deep to connect with God's redemption, and the faithfulness of the righteous is the branches, the leaves, the fruits, the visible proof of the redeem and the renew life. Now I label them as A, B, C, but actually it's perhaps more accurate to label them as A, B one, and B two. You see. The righteous faith, the believer's faith and faithfulness, are connected together as a whole. So you cannot separate them. So I gray out the righteous faith. I gray out the faith because faith is invisible. When someone tells me that I believe in Jesus, I actually don't know why. Because faith is invisible. It's just you uttering that word. But how do I know that your faith is true? Well, because I see eventually, maybe after two years, three years, I see there's a faithfulness. I see that you are keep coming to the Lord. You are come, keep coming back to worship. I see that you are reading your Bible. I see that you are praying. I see that you are living your life in accordance with God's will. And then I begin to say that your faithfulness make me know that your faith, invisible part of your life, is actually real. So what is true believing? True believing always comprises of two things: faith. And faithfulness. Faith is the part that no one can be sure. But faithfulness is the part that over time we begin to see. So true believing is a believer's response to God's faithfulness. It has to be about God's faithfulness. It's not that I believe in myself. I believe that in ten years I could be the best Christian possible. That is not faith. Faith is to know that I'm utter sinner who is incapable of saving myself. And so I throw myself to God's faithfulness. I throw myself to the fact that God has provided me with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And through my roots, rooted in Christ, I begin to grow as a Christian. And so I become my faithfulness. Faith and faithfulness are indispensable. Now that takes us to New Testament, where we find. Three times the book of Habakkuk, chapter two, verse four, are quoted in three books. The first time it's quoted is from the book of Galatians. It tells us that no one is justified by law. The second time was quoted was from Hebrews chapter ten. It tells us that true faith means enduring through suffering. The third time is quoted is in Romans chapter one, verse seventeen. It shows us the full power. Of God, the first one was about the soil and the roots. The second was about the visible new life, the branches and the fruits. And Roman is a complete picture of both the roots,、uh, the roots and the soil, as well as the branches. Don't worry, we're going to run through quickly these three books. In all three books, Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, the righteous shall live by faith. Become a very dominating theme running through them. God packs so much into that little phrase, "The righteous shall live by faith." That when this verse finally unleashed in the New Testament, it bursts open to become the spine of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So, if you are familiar with the New Testament, you will see the righteous shall live by faith is all over the map throughout the entire New Testament. We may also say that Habaku is like a petite woman, a very small in stature. Somehow she gave birth to three heavyweight sons in the New Testament. That little verse in Habaku chapter two verse four becomes a powerful, powerful element in the book of Galatians, in the book of Hebrews, and finally in the book of Romans. So the three, the themes coming out of these three books are. Justified by faith, perseverance unto life, and thirdly, the power of God unto salvation. So once again, we have very limited time here, but I still want to quickly run through the three books with you: Galatians, Hebrew, and Romans. For the three appearances of Habakkuk chapter two verse four, the just, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's begin with Galatians. Let me read to you from Galatians chapter three verse ten. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, "Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, 
and do them. Now, some of you remember the background for Galatians. Paul planted the church, and after he left the mostly Gentile believers to continue on his missionary journey, some false teacher, some what we call Judaizer, the Jews who believe that becoming a Christian means staying as a Jew while believing in Jesus. So the Judaizer came and teach the Galatian, mostly Gentile population, a different gospel. So they tell you, I heard that Paul preached the gospel to you. Paul asked you to believe in Jesus Christ. I agree. But do you know that in order for you to truly be saved, you need two things. You need faith in Christ, and you need to keep the Jewish law, like us. And so they think about, oh, wow, okay, I didn't know that. So are you willing to be circumcised? Are you willing to keep the ceremonial law, like us? And the Galatians say, yeah, we're willing. We'll do whatever God wants us to do. The problem is, that is not what God wants them to do. And so Paul wrote back and said, no, 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 no. That is not the gospel I preach to you. That's not the gospel I preach to you. They teach you a different gospel. They teach you a wrong gospel. What kind of gospel do they teach you? They teach you a potluck salvation. Have you heard of a potluck salvation? Have you done a potluck before? Potluck means I call you up and say, come to my house for dinner. But I'm only going to call, do one dish, and you have to bring your own dish. So together we form a meal. So in this potluck salvation, God brings the Lamb of God, and we bring our good works. And then together form a meal. And Paul said, no, no, the Lamb is the meal. And you come empty-handed. You actually came dirty-handed. You have nothing to bring but your sin. What do we contribute to that meal? Our sin. So that the blood of the lamb could wash it away. You didn't come with a dish. You have no dish to bring. You have no good work to bring. You come empty-handed. And you come with your sin. And you come feasting on the lamb. You see why Paul was so upset? Because the salvation we know is not a potluck salvation. God did everything. We are just there to feast on Christ. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, listen again. Cursed be everyone who does not abide all things written in the book of the law. Now this is a quote from Deuteronomy. So let me ask you, what are the things written in the book of the law, right? Curses everyone who does not keep the things that are written in the book of the law. Let me ask you, what are the things written in the book of the law? And you said, ask the lawyers. And what did the lawyers say? Well, the things that are in the book of the law are the laws, right? What else could it be? Why did they call the book of the law? No, as it turns out, the thing that are written in the book of the law is not the law. The thing that is written in the book of God's law is grace. Can you believe it? It's so confusing, right? You call that the book of the law. What else is in the book of the law but the law? No, the book of the law contains God's gift of salvation through grace. How do I know? Well, let me take you to Deuteronomy. He's quoting from Deuteronomy. Where's Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is actually the last of the books of Moses. Moses had five books, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the last of the Mosaic, uh, the five books of Moses. It's the last, it's a summary of the Mosaic law. What is Deuteronomy all about? If you get a chance to read Deuteronomy, right? There are certain phrases that keep repeating. Deuteronomy are Moses' last words beyond Jordan. Well, he is about to die, so he's writing his final sermons. Theologians say Deuteronomy all, is all about statutes, commandments, and rules. A law book, book of the law. Okay, so what is Deuteronomy all about? You say, well, Deuteronomy is about statutes, commandments, and rules. About, about what? About keeping those things so that you can be saved wrong. Deuteronomy is not about statutes, commandments, well, it, it is about statutes, commandments, and rules, but it's not about keeping them. It is about seeing the promise of God's salvation and redemption 
through statutes, commandments, and rules. Do you see a difference? No? Okay. It's all right. We'll move to the heart of the Mosaic law. If I ask you, what is the heart of the Mosaic law? Well, Moses wrote five books, right? You want a heart, right? Go to the middle book. What's the middle book? The middle book is a book by the name of Leviticus. What's the middle book about? As it turns out, the middle book is also about the statutes, commandments, you know, and regulation and rules, everything. All the five Mosaic books are kind of about that. So in Leviticus, especially, if you're a newbie, you never read Leviticus, you go to read that. So it's all about statutes, commandments, and rules. Statute, commandment, and rules about how to make offering. What kind of offering you have to? Statute and commandment and rules about what kind of fees you are supposed to keep. Statute, commandment and rules for the priests. What dress they have to wear. How do they clean themselves? Statutes, commandment and rules about cleansing. Right? And then you realize that the book was written in a chiastic structure. What does that mean? The most important thing is always in the middle. So don't read on the side note. Read what is in the middle. The book of Leviticus, just like the book of Deuteronomy, is about commandments, statutes, and rules. But what is at the heart of it? At the heart of it is this Deuter Le Leviticus chapter 16, the Day of Atonement. What is the heart of the Mosaic Law? It's the Day of Atonement. What is the Day of Atonement about? It's a story of two goats. Well, let me just read two verses from you. On that day, that most important day in Jewish calendar, Aaron, the high priest, shall cast Lot over to go. I, I never understand this part. I will tell you why. One Lot for the Lord and the other Lot for Azazel. Azazel okay? And Aaron shall present the goat on which the Lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. So there are two goats, you cast a lot, which one will go to the Lord, which one will go to Azazel, okay? The Lord, oh, you cast a lot, this goat go to the Lord, what does it mean? It means you go before the Lord, slaughter it, kill it. What about Azazel? Now some of you have heard my interpretation about it. It's, there's some discussion and debate, but most people, most scholars believe that Azazel means that you take that goat to a faraway place outside the camp, away from God, over a cliff, and push this goat over. No, so the thing I don't understand is why you cast a lot. Both both go end up dying anyway. There was no good lot and bad lot. Both means death. What is happening here? What's happening here? Well, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So one goat is slaughtered right in front of God for the blood. What the other goal about is that the priest will put all the sins of Israel on the head of this goat and send the goat away to push it over to them. What is this about? It is about what God will eventually do to our sin. And there's only one way that could save us. He needs two goats or one, one lamb, Jesus Christ. Everything point to the middle. So here's a trick question again. You always remember, people ask you, what is the book of the law about? Don't ask the lawyer, ask the theologian. The lawyer say, the book of the law is about the law. The theologian says, the book of the law is about grace. The book of the law is about the lamb. The book of the law is, look at what God did for us. All these rules and statutes and commandments are just side dishes. And at the middle, you have the main one the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of this world. So when you bring this picture back to Galatians, Paul says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide all things written in the book of the law. What is written in the book of the law? Watch the Lamb. And when you don't watch the Lamb, when you say, let's do potluck, let's bring our good work, you ruin the meal. What is written in the book of the law? Not keep the law and you shall live, but watch the Lamb and you shall live. And that is the message of Galatians. Okay, we have to move on to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of the Lord, you may receive what is promised. 
yet a little while, the coming one will come. The coming one will come, and the coming one is Jesus Christ. And he will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. Now, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. But the righteous, the, the righteous one shall live by faith. And if he strain back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who strain back and are destroyed, but those who have faith. What is the author of Hebrews talking about? He's talking about true faith endure, endure through difficulty, trials, to do the will of God. What is the will of God? Stay faithful to the Lord, so you may receive what is promised. What is promised? The kingdom. The kingdom. Some of you know the background of the book of Hebrews. Biblical scholar believe that the book of Hebrews was written around the year 80, 70s, uh, 80, 60s, to a group of Christians in Rome. They are living, uh, they are meeting in house churches. High percentage of Jewish convert. At that time, there are certain benefits of being Jew in the city of Rome. But when you become Christian, you lose all those benefits. So there's no protection. So they, they begin to face persecution. And then you have Nero, who was the emperor then. He began to persecute the Christians. So that is, if you are a Christian in Rome at that time, it's under heavy, heavy pressure. So what happened to them? Some of them decided to stop being Christian. And they reason in the mind, well, I'm returning to my Jewish faith. You know, I'm still a worshiper of Yahweh. I just don't worship Jesus because worshiping Jesus means that I have no legal protection. So why don't I just go back to worship Yahweh? I just leave behind Jesus a little bit and I have Yahweh. I'm still a worshiper of Yahweh, right? And the author of Hebrews said, no, no, no. When you take away Jesus, you take away everything. You have nothing left. And so they urged these Christians under heavy persecution. No, you have to follow this great shepherd. The just shall live, the, the righteous shall live by faith, by their faithfulness to the great shepherd. You have to follow the great shepherd. You have to go and desire a better and heavenly country. You're going with him into another world and you must turn back over all these good things even of this world. You can lose all these things, but you cannot lose Jesus. You have to keep following Jesus to pilgrim to us and the other world. The righteous shall live by their faith. What does it mean? It means fixing our eyes on Jesus. It means carrying our cross and faithfully following Jesus' footstep. And that takes us to Romans. I want to take you to Romans chapter 1, the final part that we are going to quickly read through. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because the gospel at that, at that time brings shame to you. But I'm not ashamed, Paul said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm going to Rome, and the gospel will bring me shame. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and to the Greeks. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That righteousness is attained through faith. As is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And the righteous, now, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous are the Christian. The Christian shall live by faith. What will, gain, what will you gain when you have faith? Well, you will get the righteousness of God. So I want you to think about the righteous, like the second righteousness is kind of, Confusing. So instead of reading, the righteous shall live by faith, the Christian, the true Christian shall live by faith. And when you have faith and trust in God, what will you get? You will get the righteousness of God. Let me take you to Romans 3 and 6. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified by his grace as a gift. How do you receive the gift? You receive the gift by faith. The Christian shall live by faith. When you have faith, you receive the righteousness of God. You are justified by His grace through the redemption of what is in Christ Jesus. But still, that is not the end of the story. Because the righteousness that you receive will become a controlling power. So I remember when I was studying uh, in seminary, my professor used to tell us, in Romans, that this two big ideas. The righteousness of God functions both as a gift received by faith and then received 
a power, a controlling power in the Christian life. So here in chapter 3, when we receive by through faith God's righteousness, that righteousness is a gift. It makes us clean. It makes us justify. It declares us as righteous before God. But that same righteousness becomes a controlling power, ruling power in our life. Chapter 6, verse 13. Do not present your member to sin, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instrument for righteousness. Now I no longer serve this world. I don't serve sin. I serve righteousness. I serve God's righteousness as a controlling power in my life. I will bear fruits. I will give up, uh, give rise to branches and leaves. I will live a life of faithful obedience following our Lord Jesus. If that, all that makes you confused, don't worry, we still have the one minute homily to close it all up. This is one minute homily about Habakkuk, but it begins with Nahum, because they are a pair, remember? Nahum toppled Nineveh and Assyria. Habakkuk declared judgment against Babylon. But Habakkuk added a positive note. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by faith. One monumental utterance, three interconnected interpretations. The righteous covenant keeper of God shall live by his faithfulness, their faith and their faithfulness. God's faithfulness accomplished his promise of salvation at the cross. The righteous put their faith in Christ, and that faith grows roots in God's love, bearing fruits to a life of cross-bearing and living sacrifice. Habakkuk, a mother of the Old Testament, gave birth to three New Testament sons. Galatians, justified by faith. Hebrews, persevere unto life. And finally, Romans, justified by his grace as gift, present yourself now to God as instrument for righteousness. This is true faith and true life. Let's close by with three points to apply Habakkuk. Habakkuk means U-turn is the way. Judgment on Babylon, righteous live by faith. Faithfulness of God, faith and faithfulness of man. And finally, a mother of three sons, a justified living as sacrifice to our God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, this must be challenging for us um, in both the intellectual way as well as in the practical way. So we pray for your wisdom and we pray for patience. We pray also for an urgency, an urgency to know your word and an urgency to live your word. I pray that this morning for our people, that all of them first will repent and return to the Lord, that all of them will find grace in the book of the law, all of them, as they read through the book of the law, they will discover Jesus, high and lifted up, present to us as the perfect Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation we believe in is not a potluck salvation. We didn't bring anything to the table. We have nothing to bring to the table but our sins and transgression but you invite us to the table nonetheless. And we pray that in participating in that feast of the Lamb, that we shall gain strength, that our life will be renewed, that our faith will become true, that it's not just a faith that leads to justification, it's also a faith that leads to a life of living sacrifice. So will you help us, Lord, this morning? And give us a determination for the rest of our life to know your word and to live your word. Thank you, Lord. We pray all that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.